Okay. Guess who's back? Back again. Hey guys, what do you, what is going on? Uh, we're talking about how to fuel properly for your marathon. Um, so are you running a marathon soon or is running a marathon on your bucket list, but you really haven't figured out how to fuel properly um, and it, it's kept you from running a marathon. Our Healthy Runner Registered Dietitian, Brooks Arnecki, is back, back again, and she is going to tell us all about the best ways to make sure that you are properly fueled for your big day. Um, she's going to really break down what to do the weeks before, during the marathon, post-marathon, and how to avoid the dreaded wall that so many runners um, unfortunately fall uh, victim to, uh, as did I during my uh, first marathon. And I'm currently training for my second. So I'm hoping to not hit that wall. And I'm hoping to pick up some awesome tips from Brooke today. Um, really, Brooke is going to break down everything you need to know regarding your nutrition, fueling, your hydration, and electrolytes. So if you've ever wondered, like, do you need to fuel during the marathon? How much should you eat? to train uh, for a marathon? When should you eat when building up for a marathon? Um, what should you not eat uh, when running a marathon? How many gels should you eat during a marathon? How much fluid should you drink? Uh, do you need electrolytes? And how do you get in those electrolytes? Um, we're going to be covering all of that during today's episode. Um, for those of you that don't know, Brooks Arnecki is our reg uh, resident healthy runner, uh, registered dietitian dietitian, nutritionist, and um, she provides some serious value within our Healthy Runner Facebook group, as well as our one-on-one -on -one, uh, personalized Healthy Runner coaching program, um, and has created some specific modules in how to nourish your body as a runner. So uh, Brooke, thank you so much for coming back on the show for your fourth appearance on the Healthy Runner podcast. Welcome. Yeah. Thank you. I can't believe it's our fourth episode, but it's always fun to be here. Yeah. Time flies when you're having fun. And for those <laughs> who are uh, new to our audience and haven't checked out the other three episodes that you've been on, uh, can you just give them a little brief uh, background on who you are and what you do? Yes. Yeah, so my name is Brooks Arnecki. I'm a registered dietitian and I help runners fuel not only for running, but also for their life. Because if you're not fueling your everyday life, you cannot be fueling your runs. So I teach clients how to do this, runners how to do this every single day and do it in a non-restrictive way. Because you know, if we're restricting our food, we're not having a healthy relationship with food and likely not having a healthy relationship with running. So I'm all about embracing a positive relationship with food and your body. And we do that through eating nourishing foods that taste good to us. So that's, that's what I do. I love your mindset. And a lot of our clients really resonate with your message. And I've gotten such great feedback in your previous uh, podcast episodes. Um, for those of you who want to check out some of those kind of previous episodes, um, you're going to want to check out episode 87 on the Healthy Runner podcast, um, in which Brooke talked about what you need to know about um, REDS or R-E-D-S um, and running, um, so relative energy deficiency syndrome, um, as well as she shared in episode 107 for nutrition, uh, running nutrition habits anyone can do. And then in episode 119, uh, this was really great because it was the nutrition basics for running. And that one was super helpful um, for many of our runners in our community. So I would recommend you all check out those previous um, deep dives that Brooke has shared all of her knowledge um, with us and how we can nourish our bodies um, as runners. So just kind of a quick uh, recap, um, because for those that don't know, what uh, state are you in or that you currently reside in? I currently reside in Alaska in Anchorage. So it's, it's been a blast, but it's, it's a little bit chilly here in August. So it's like mid fifties and rain for like the last three weeks, which I'm sure many of you are dreaming about if you're like living in a, a Southern state or a hotter climate, <laughs> um, I but I am like wishing I had more sunshine right now, but that's okay. <laughs> I know it's it's been a pretty brutal summer in terms of like heat and temperatures. Um, I know all of our clients uh, who live in Texas in our program, like they've been getting like you know triple digits since it seems like since like May I think this year. And um, you know here in the Northeast, actually, I think today I saw this morning um, was the first 
day in, I don't know, like 40 something days that the temperature went below, I don't even know, 80 something degrees. So yeah, we've had a pretty warm uh, winter and we had a very like hot stretch of humidity here in the East Coast. And um, last week when I was on vacation in Turks and Caicos, which was absolutely amazing um, and running in dew points of 75 degrees, which is like right on that threshold of being like pretty dangerous. And luckily I only had easy runs on the calendar, but it was super humid, super hot, super sweaty. And then I saw your post of your uh, trail hike that you did a uh, full day, like hike that was just, um, you know, cold and rainy and you were like freezing. And I was like, wow, this is like totally different uh, than, <laughs> you know, than the uh, climate that I was in. So um, totally. yeah, it's getting to that colder time of the year for you, huh? Yes. And yeah, like hat gloves, like the whole deal. So yeah, but it's, it's all relative, you know, we'll have, we'll have snow in a couple of weeks probably. And we'll be wishing that we have the fifties. So oh it's all goodness. good. <laughs> I'm sure you will be. Um, so let's get into today's topic because you really want to talk about like how we can fuel um, and and do the proper nutrition for the marathon. The marathon's a beast. Um, we all know that. Uh, it's something that, you know, it took me five years to go back for seconds and to run my second marathon, uh, which I will be doing in two months. And I'm halfway actually through my training, which is like crazy, That's crazy. Uh, eight weeks in and halfway point. Um, but I really want to make sure that I optimize, um, you know, fueling, um, hydration, electrolytes, all of those things that are so important. Um, so for those who are just getting into this topic and kind of dipping their toes, um, you know, first uh, question I have for you really is, do I need to fuel during the marathon? Yes, 100%. Absolutely. If you're a person that has done a marathon previously, or maybe you've heard somebody that's done a marathon and they're like, oh, you just got to get to that mile 20. And then after that, it's just like, you're just hanging on. It shouldn't be that way. And a lot of times, you know, you get to that mile 20 and you're just hanging on because your nutrition isn't optimal. So it is possible to run all 26 miles feeling strong, but you've got to make sure that you're supporting that not only with nutrition, but like also hydration too. So yes, yes, yes. You need to fuel during a marathon. Yeah. So, and it really relates to the length of time, right? That we're out there and how much like energy we're expending basically. Um, in running all those 26.2 miles. Totally. Yeah. So what, you know, the amount of fuel that you need is completely different than the amount of fuel somebody else needs. And, you know, we're going to, we'll definitely dive into that, but yes, it, it is all time dependent it's based on your body and all of what you need, weather too, like lots of different variables. So I'll try to keep it simple for you all today and really give you tangible tips to at least give you a starting point. Okay. So let's go into the topic of kind of training because um, mm -hmm. hopefully if someone's finding this um, video um, or listening to this podcast episode, they're kind of training for the marathon. It's not like the marathon's tomorrow. Um, so, you know, how much should I eat when training for a marathon? Yeah. So it'll totally depend on the person, but you're you should expect your intake to increase during marathon training because you're using a lot more energy as you're training for this marathon. So you're going to be wanting to have a lot more carbohydrates than maybe you're used to a lot more overall calories than what you're used to, but a lot of those extra calories need to be carbohydrates. So that might look like, you know, adding in a pre-workout snack, adding in a post-workout snack, maybe having more snacks throughout the day. Um, you know, at least making sure that you're having three meals a day. So expect your intake to increase as, as your training increases. Um, you know, I find that's a very common mistake that a lot of us just don't even really think about, you know, as your miles increase, you don't really adjust your snacks or your meals, and then you're tired and you're like, why am I so tired? Um, and I say, did you adjust your nutrition at all? And the answer is usually no. So, you know, those simple things as your mileage increases, so should your carbs, so should your intake. Um, so follow-up questions to that. Yeah. So, uh, and I think this is a common thing that we hear a lot from uh, runners in our community is um, they actually feel hungrier, right? When training for a marathon, why is that? Yeah, because you're burning more fuel, right? And I, I sometimes I hear the opposite too of you're either a lot more hungry or you're not hungry at all. And either one, it doesn't mean like 
if you're not hungry, you shouldn't eat. You know, we have to actually push through that and eat against that not having being hungry. Um, but to me, if you're not hungry during marathon training, that means that you're really in underfueling territory. And on the opposite spectrum, if you're hungry, we've got to feed into that and we've got to listen to that and eat more. So on either ends of the spectrum, you've got to eat more. Um, so don't be afraid to include more into your training. You know, little things can make the biggest difference. Right. And it, I, I know myself personally, really, I've felt that, you know, after long runs, like I just went for a hard um, 60 miler the other day um, with some kind of, as Coach Lou calls it, some spice in there with some marathon yeah. piece uh, miles. And I know that, you know, when I got back, I like wasn't hungry at all. Why? are we not hungry? Like after a long effort, when we're doing these long runs or even like after the race, because I've noticed mm -hmm. that even the half marathons, when I go out there, hard effort, it's not like, you know, you like immediately get off, you get your medal and then they like shuffle you over to like the food tent. And you're like, I really don't want to eat right now. I'm like totally. totally not hungry. Like, why is that? Yeah. Exercise naturally decreases your appetite and those hunger hormones. So when you are running. I mean, if you think about running, just like in general, you're putting a lot of stress on your body. And when your body is under a lot of stress, you're just not going to be hungry. So it is completely natural for your body to not be hungry after a long effort, after that long run, after that race, you've just put your body under a lot of stress. So it's actually totally normal for you not to feel hungry after a run, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't be fueling after and, you know, waiting hours and hours because then you're not getting that recovery that you need. And you can probably feel it, right? Like if you don't recover properly after that long run, it's like hours go by and then you suddenly just get slammed with that hunger and you're like, oh my gosh, I need to eat everything right now. Um, and that's right. really hard to catch up. And then you're sore and all of those negative consequences of, you know, not going or from going long hours without eating. All right. So while we are out there for those 26.2 miles, um, you know, our blood flow is like going to our musculoskeletal system, right? It's going yep. to those muscles and it's kind of going away from our digestive system, right? And it's not kind of functioning as it should and giving those cues to our brain that, hey, like I'm hungry, like nourish me. Um, but what you're saying is even though we're not getting those cues and we don't feel hunger, it is important to actually eat, even if you don't feel hungry, um, because it is going to impact our recovery from that um, either long run or from the race. 100%. Yep. Okay. And I've, I've seen it firsthand with my clients that, you know, I've, I've had one client that she like, she just could not tolerate anything um, after her long run. And once we started integrating eating, properly, like even way before her runs, but also during her runs, she was able to tolerate food after her runs. And she's like, I never thought that that would be possible for me. I just thought I was somebody that could never eat after a run, but you know, it was just because she wasn't eating enough. So yeah, I've seen it follow through that way where as you are properly nourishing yourself, you're able to handle those, um, those cues and, you know, kind of fight through that and be able to nourish yourself and again, improve recovery, have better energy all around, not just after that recovery window. So it's, it's really cool and really neat to see how it all plays, plays a role. But as a runner, we can't always just rely on those hunger cues and fullness cues to tell us when to eat and when not to eat. I know it, it made a difference for me when um, I've heard a bunch of times, and even when I had Claire Bartholik on the show um, from the Run to the Top podcast, and she talked about almost like training your stomach, like how we train our muscles. So then like for me, from a physical therapist standpoint, it made sense. I'm like, oh yeah, duh. You're like strengthening your quads to be able to tolerate the demands of like running downhill um, during your race. And I was like, oh, so we need to like train our stomach to tolerate foods. Cause I was the same way. Like I never eat before any run. I was always going out fasted because I didn't want to feel full. And I just felt yeah. like heavy and like, you know, I didn't want that feeling. But then when we look at performance standpoint and when I wanted to get faster um, as a runner and, you know, be able to get some PRs, then once I started fueling, it made like a world of a difference and really kind of starting out slowly, right? Because you have to like train, you don't go from like zero, just like you wouldn't, you know, 
never right. do squats before, then you're going to load up like the squat rack with like 400 <laughs> pounds and be like, Hey, I'm going to start squatting. Right. You got to kind of gradually build it up like you would when you're training your uh, muscles. Yes. 100%. You got to train that gut for sure. And we can, we'll definitely chat about that today too. Yeah. And so a common topic, and this is always like, everyone's like question is like, what do I eat? Um, so what should we eat um, when building up for a marathon? So I guess really, you know, probably during training and, you know, thinking about those long runs, um, you know, what are the types of foods that we should be um, eating? Gosh, that is a loaded question. <laughs> uh, I'll, I do like to talk about the performance plate a lot of times with, with my athletes. And I know that I touched on this in the, um, the modules that we talked about in the Healthy Runner uh, program. But the performance plate, I think, can really help put things into perspective. So I want to talk specifically about like after a hard effort or even before a hard effort, what should your plate look like? Because I know it's just so confusing. You can look up all these meal plans and you're like, well, I still have no idea what to do. So one really tangible thing to take away is before a hard effort, after a hard effort, or even on a day where you're like, I just feel really depleted. I feel like I need more. When you're looking at your plate, I want you to imagine half of your plate being carbohydrates. So pasta, rice, any sort of bread, grain, um, you know, fruit, potatoes, Half of your plate should be carbohydrates, a quarter of your plate should be protein, and then another quarter of your plate can be a fruit or a vegetable. So what happens when we're marathon training is that level of carbohydrate increases. So, you know, on a, on a day that maybe you're not working as hard, that those carbohydrates are going to decrease a little bit. But on the days where you're really putting full effort out there, it can be really helpful to just have a visual to imagine, like, what... What, what should I be eating? So I hope that helps a little bit, gives some perspective. Um, but but the the big idea there is that the carbohydrates essentially increase as your training increases. All right. So just like your shirt says in my shirt, carbs <laughs> give me spark. <laughs> so Brooke and I both are repping the new the new uh, merch, uh, um, our Healthy Runner merch. Uh, we got some great t-shirts. Uh, Shout out to uh, Shauna from Stiletto Running, uh, who's provided us with some bang up, very comfortable t-shirts. We were talking about so that comfy. before. And <laughs> such a great message. Um, it's all about the carbs, right? The carbs are going to give us our spark. I've heard, you know, some of this fat adapted stuff going around and, you know, low carb diets and, um, you know, all of that. Um, but everything that I've learned from you and other registered dietitians, is that the carbs are going to be the most efficient energy source, right? For totally. performance. And, and another thing that I heard that I thought was kind of interesting is that the whole fat adapted thing, number one, I don't know if this is true, you tell me, but what I did uh, hear and or learn or maybe learn is that it does take an extremely long amount of time. So it's something like kind of like that topic of heart rate training that we were talking about with Denny um, in the last um, or two podcast episodes ago that it, it's, you got to be patient and it takes a really long time. And then I did hear um, something about like, it really depends upon your genetics and not like everyone can become like fat adapted and utilize fat for energy. I don't know anything, any, any insight you can add into that at all. I mean, the bottom line is that fat adapted running, you're asking your body to do something that it's not genetically programmed to do or physiologically programmed to do. So you're just making your body work a lot harder for something that it can already do if you just eat carbohydrates. Um, and the genetic piece may have something to do with it, but we are so far off from knowing, you know, like how to eat for your genes at this point, that I, I really, we can't even like bring it into the conversation just because we just don't know a lot about it yet. I mean, I think that eventually that will be huge, but we just don't know at this point, like the nutrigenomics of everything is just so new. Um, but, you know, at this point, it's like, why make your body work harder for something that it already, it already does when you eat carbohydrates. So that's my argument for that. And, you know, if somebody feels great on fat adapted running, I'm not here to like tell them not to do it, but for the majority of people, it's not going to work. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. And, you know, you talked about 
kind of that that plate of being pretty much from what I um, gathered there, carb should be like 50%, right? Of that like performance plate. Yeah. So that that would be like, you know, how much um, you should do. And, um, you know, are there kind of go to carb sources that you like to recommend for your runners? Or, you know, what should marathon runners not eat? Is there anything they should avoid or really may cause some either GI discomfort and or is not going to be the best fuel source? The only so I don't believe that any foods are off limits, but the common mistake that I see with a lot of runners is they're loading up on really high fibrous foods and that is causing them to be extremely full. So then they're actually under fueling because they're filling up on fiber and not filling up on nutrient or calorie dense foods. So for example, like sometimes I see um, my plant-based athletes, they will have like protein pasta with a whole bunch of fiber in it. And then they'll have lentils and then they'll have a big old plate of fruits and veggies. And that's just a lot of fiber. So they're eating a lot of volume of food but they're not eating the calories that they need to support their training. So I'm actually recommending a lot of the time, like, Hey, I, I love that you love your fruits and veggies, but let's dial back on those a little bit and let's add in some simple carbs. Like let's add in some white pasta, some white rice, and then let's add your veggies to that. But we don't need to be having like all of these, um, nutrient mineral dense foods every single time. Like we've got to have a good mix of both so that you get your energy or calories that you need to support your training. Um, as well as, you know, your vitamins and minerals and all that good stuff from your fruits and vegetables. But that's the common, the common mistake that I see. And that's why I bring the performance plate into it because you can see that like majority of what you need is just, we need calories, um, first and foremost. And then we've got to worry about the balance and the things later on. So does that, make, right. does that make sense? Yeah, no, it does because I'm a big fan of like a nice salad with some grilled chicken. Um, and I think most people would feel like, hey, I'm eating healthy, right? And mm -hmm. hey, I'm training for this marathon. Like I'm doing a healthy habit and I'm running consistently. So I got to eat healthy, right? To complement my sport or my running. And if you're not keeping aware that, hey, like I really don't have any carbs that are going to give me energy in this plate. Um, so are there things that you recommend to add to that salad, let's say, um, that can give you some kind of little bang for your buck, a little energy kick um, from a carb standpoint to give that spark? Yeah. So add, you know, add, leg add lentils, add legumes, add a piece of bread, add two pieces of bread, like just have some toast on the side or something that, you know, oftentimes I am recommending that people like add some pasta to their salad, add some rice to your salad. Um, just adding some more nutrient or calorie density to those salads will really, really help. And a lot of times bread is really easy to eat. So a lot of times my, my runners will do like a baguette or two pieces of toast, a bagel, something like that to, to bulk up the calories in their salad. Cause yeah, salads are great, but if you find yourself hungry, like an hour later, that wasn't enough for you. So. Right. Is quinoa a, a good energy so source? Yes. Okay. Quinoa would be wonderful to add. Thank you for, I forgot that. That's a really easy one. Yeah, to add. We've been, we've it been adding sense. that in our salads. Like it doesn't feel like it's too much food, you know, so you're not mm -hmm. like super full, but um, yeah, we've been adding that in our household. Um, yeah. Yeah. So how about, you know, during our long runs and actually, um, fueling during the marathon. Um, maybe even if you can just share like what are your best recommendations before the race? So you know wake up that morning, um, race morning, and then we could talk about like nutrition wise during um, the race itself and like if gels is something you recommend, how many gels you know should you eat during the marathon? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So morning of the marathon, don't do anything differently than you did while you were training. So as you're training for your marathon, you're not just like running and training for your runs. You're also like really training your nutrition as well. So what you're doing throughout training just needs to translate into race day. You don't need to do anything different on race day, but a lot of common uh, pre-race items are things that are really carbohydrate dense with maybe a little bit of protein. We don't want a very high fat meal right before you go out on your long run or your, your race. It's just going to sit heavy in your stomach, cause cramps, the GI distress that we all dread during the marathon, right? So, you know, good examples might be 
a big bowl of oatmeal with some peanut butter or oatmeal with a little bit of a protein shake on the side. Um, a bagel with cream cheese, a little bit of cream cheese or a bagel with peanut butter, maybe with a piece of fruit, um, you know, some toast with a piece of fruit before you head out. So carbohydrate heavy, um, that is easily settling in your stomach. So nothing too heavy, nothing that, you know, causes GI distress, um, probably a little, you know, don't have a lot of dairy before you go out on those, on those long runs, those marathon race days, Um, so yeah, stick to your oatmeals, your bagels, your toasts, pancakes, you know, carbs. (laughs) The theme of this episode should be carbs. (laughs) (laughs) The title of the episode is now carbs. Uh, (laughs) yeah. So they're going to digest easily. This is not the time to have like the whole wheat products, the whole wheat bread, um, and anything that's going to be slower digesting that has a lot of fiber. Um, I know my go-to for race morning is oatmeal, um, with a banana. I'll have some of my, you can, um, almond butter in there in my oatmeal itself. So getting a little protein, very little bit of, you know, fats in there, but usually I'll just do like a tablespoon in there. Um, but yeah, that has worked out well. I know some people love oatmeal. Some people don't love oatmeal Mm -hmm. and some people like love the bagel or love the toast with peanut butter on it. Um, it seems like bananas, if someone eats bananas, I know there's a couple of people who just like have an aversion to bananas. I think coach cat is one of them. Um, (laughs) but yeah, like that seems to like digest easily for most people. It seems like if I had to say like one food, that's like a staple by runners, I feel like it's like the banana. Yes. So (laughs) easily digested. It's low in that fructose, which can sometimes cause that GI distress. Um, so it's really, yeah, super versatile. You can have it. It's easy, you know, before after it, it's just great so bananas are super popular for that reason they just just get on the gut so for for most people not all but <laughs> and all right, so the thing that we oh sorry doing but the thing yeah. that we haven't talked about before that i forgot to mention was um electrolytes it is a good idea to load up on electrolytes like the morning of your marathon so whether you like you know whatever electrolyte product you like to use have that in a 16 ounce glass of water and you're going to preload your electrolytes perfectly for your race. So that's another thing that I absolutely recommend that definitely can step up your game, you know, just, just a little bit, but just enough where you're like, that was great. So hydration the the morning of is also equally important. Okay. Yeah. So we're definitely going to kind of get into hydration and electrolytes, maybe a little separate, but I love that you added it in that we're going to do that before the race itself and kind of preload. Um, Cool. And then what about during the race? Like, are you a fan of gels, blocks? Um, I don't know, waffles, like I've never tried those, but I know some people uh, do that. You know, what do you recommend to your athletes to fuel um, during the race in terms of like nutrition wise? Mm -hmm. So a lot of my athletes use gels, they use goose, but some of my athletes can't tolerate those. So really it's going to depend on what you know that you can tolerate. And again, that takes that training, that practice during those long runs when you're training out for your marathon. So experiment with those and know what works for you. Don't do anything different on race day, but you know, know if you like the gels, know if you like the chews, you know, some people are like, I can barely breathe when I'm, you know, munching on a chew. So it's so much more than just like what your body can tolerate with your gut, but also the feasibility of you eating it. I know for me personally, I cannot chew and run and like, yeah, it's just too much for me. So (laughs) I've got to do the gel. (laughs) Um, And every gel is different. So if one gel doesn't work for you, don't let that ruin the rest of the gels for you. Lots of gels are formulated differently. Um, They've got different ingredients. So, you know, experiment around with the gels. If you know they don't really work, there's lots of different options for you. I do find that people who don't tolerate gels well, do really, really well with the chews. And I honestly think that's just because they digest a little bit slower and it's not all that sugar going into your body at once. Um, So you've really got to experiment with what works. You know, waffles, great. Anything, anything that you can get down in a race that's carbohydrate heavy is going to be great. Okay. And if someone was kind of having the gels, 
Um, I know we always recommend like definitely find out, you know, what that race is actually providing on the course. Yeah. And then honestly, for a lot of my athletes, I just recommend like, don't rely on those because, Hey, you never know, right. You can't get it. Yeah. Like bring your own, figure out yeah. how you're going to stash them in your pockets and belts and whatever to bring with you. But, you know, is there a general rule in terms of like how many gels you should uh, take in during a marathon? Yeah. So I recommend 30 grams of carb at minimum per hour that you can go up to 60 grams of carb per hour. You can even go up to 90 grams of carb per hour. That's going to be dependent on the person. And again, what your gut can tolerate, you have to train up to these things. So 30 grams per hour is the bare minimum that I recommend. And depending on the type of gel, that could be anywhere from two gels an hour to like one and a half per hour. So what does that look like? You could be taking a gel every 30 to 45 minutes. Um, so it's not out of the question to need more than one gel an hour. You just have to look at the back of the gel and, and see what it is going to give you. Um, but that minimum should be 30 grams of carb per hour and your hydration fluids also count towards that. So, you know, if you have carbs in your drink, that also counts, but you know, anywhere from one to two gels an hour, every 30 to 45 minutes. And it's going to depend on the product because not all gels again are created equal. All right. So basically read what it says on the back of your product. Most of them will say how often they recommend uh, taking them, but then just also take into account guys that, you know, everyone is different. Um, we all digest differently um, performance wise, right. depending upon how hard you're pushing during your race, I think will probably affect what our fueling needs are, and then also how long you're out there. So if you're a sub three hour marathoner versus you're a four hour versus a five, six hour, you're out there for a longer period of time, you're going to need mm -hmm. more gels, right? Yeah. And to maintain that fuel. So all of those variables, I know there's a lot of gray in there. Um, we're, we're trying our best to provide a little clarity on, uh, you know, these commonly asked questions, but just make sure that, you know, you, what works for one person might not work for you. And then, you know, like Brooke said, take a look at the brands and their recommendations that they have on the back um, as well. So I think the common thing is that most people are not taking enough fuel and they just figure like, oh, I'll take two or three gels. Like, for a marathon, you know, I would say almost probably everyone should at least take four to five, right? At, at least at minimum. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. And I've heard some like, you know, elite athletes taking like four an hour. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, if they're doing it, and not that we should always compare everything to the elites because we are, are recreational runners, right? Mm -hmm. um, but you know, I think a common mistake is that we're not fueling enough. And I think a common mistake I see a lot in athletes is they didn't think they needed it because they felt yes. good in miles one through 10 of the marathon. They felt great. They didn't need any fuel. They weren't hungry, but yep. it's a matter of it's going to catch up to you, right? So you almost yes. have to take it even if you're not hungry, even if you're not feeling fatigued. Yep. Start early. Yeah. Within the first 30 to 45 minutes, you've got to be having something. And there are many long runs where I'm out there and I'm like, Ugh, God, I don't want to eat something right now, but you got to do it. And like, you know, those are the times where you're going to have the best long runs and the best races because you've set yourself up for success. So if you wait until you're hungry or you wait until you're bonking to have a gel, your first gel, you've gone too long. It's too late. You can't backpedal out of that. So, you know, just keep that in mind. You've got to start early. And, you know, a lot of my athletes will have a lot of the watches now have like a nutrition timer. So you can have it go off. Like you can set it, you know, remind me every 15 minutes to take a sip of water, remind me every 30 minutes to take my gel. And there's like a little timer that goes off. So, you know, technology can be useful in that sense. So you're not you know, constantly looking down and checking, but yeah, start early. Okay. okay. Yeah. Early and often. Awesome. Yes. Super helpful. So let's switch gears a little bit to hydration. Um, I feel like this is probably a stupid question, but hey, you never know. Um, do I need to hydrate? Like, Because I know a lot of people don't hydrate for a 5K and a 10K, but do we need to hydrate um, during the marathon and why? Yes. So definitely hydrate before the marathon and during your marathon. Um, but you know, the key here again is not to overdo it. it. It's a delicate balance, right? Because you can overdo your hydration and you can also underdo it. So really what I recommend is adding electrolytes. So, you know, that 16 ounces before you get out, 
add your electrolytes to that. You're going to preload a little bit of sodium. And the reason why we add electrolytes is because it helps us, it helps the electrolytes in the water get into our system. So I don't know if you've ever had a time where you're out there running, you're drinking water and it's just sloshing around in your stomach and you're like, Oh God, this doesn't feel good. It's just sloshing around by adding electrolytes to that. That's going to help mitigate that effect because the, the water is able to be absorbed into the gut a little bit easier. So that's why we add electrolytes. Um, now for during, during the marathon, while you're hydrating on your long runs, while you're hydrating, trying to make an emphasis, you have to be practicing these things. Um, you, you want to take small sips every 15, 10 to 15 minutes, um, so that you're not overloading your gut all at once. So, you know, if you're, I, I recommend doing the handheld water bottles versus the, um, bladders, because then you can keep track of how much you're drinking. So at bare minimum, I tell my athletes, try to aim for 16 ounces of water an hour. And some people that might be like a ton from what they're doing right now. So if that's you, you know, don't automatically just start chugging water on your long runs, work up to that. So maybe start with eight ounces an hour and then work your way up to that minimum of the 16 ounces, but you can need up to 24 to 32 ounces an hour during the, the marathon, especially if you are in a hot climate. Um, it's not uncommon for you to need more water. It's actually like that's normal to need more, more water as the heat increases. Um, so every, you know, 10 to 15 minutes, take a couple of sips, make sure you're keeping track of how much you're doing and definitely add those electrolytes in because it's going to help prevent that sloshy stomach feeling. Yeah. And yeah, we even recommend to a lot of our athletes, um, you know, walk those water stops because it's more important for you to actually get the water in your system <laughs> than yeah. you get like a tiny sip and the rest splashes all over your face. And then you get all short of breath, you mess up your stride anyway. And now you're like panicking because, you know, you, you lost, you know, the pack that you were running with. Um, so I highly recommend, I do that at pretty much all my half marathons now is, you know, pretty much walk, take some steps, get the water in me, throw the cup and then boom, I'm back off, you know, get back in my pace, back in my groove. Um, yeah. But yeah, taking that before you definitely before you feel thirsty, right, is super important because it's almost mm -hmm. too late at that point, right? Yeah, it is so it is so hard. And I know this because I again I've struggled with this all summer. It is so hard to take that first sip within your first two miles, but it's like it is so worth it it's to pay it's so it like just pays off immediately. Um, you've got to stay on top of it and like just force yourself to do it. But every just little sips, you don't need to take big sips. Just little sips every, you know, 15 minutes will make such a big difference. And I definitely feel that my half marathon that I did a couple of weeks ago, I was like trying to run, trying to drink the water. And I was like, why didn't I just bring my own stuff? Um, Cause I <laughs> right. wasn't getting enough and I had a lot of GI distress. And I didn't feel good towards the end. So, you know, mm -hmm. it's, it's always a learning curve. It's always a process, but really important to stay on top of it. Right. No, it's super important. And I think it is a, a common mistake um, most runners make. And it is worth, you know, the effort to practice, like you mentioned. Um, and I think the other thing I hear too is from, you know, us 40 year old, you know, 50 year old, 60 year old runner, you're like, my bladder can't tolerate drinking that much. But when you're in a race mode, it's like completely different. Right. Like, especially if you're going out and it's not a fun run, you know, a fun race, and you're not just going out at your easy pace. If you're looking to challenge yourself, like the body goes into like fight or flight and it's not worried about like, you know, peeing. Um, I have like knock on wood here, but you know, in the 28 half marathons that I've done, I have literally not had to stop to pee once. Um, but all of my long runs, I literally have to stop my easy long runs. I have to stop like two or three times, right? Like, don't have the strongest bladder and I make sure I'm hydrating, right? I'm practicing, but I usually do have to stop and pee, you know, during my easy runs. Um, but when you're in race mode and it's like fight or flight and you're running faster, your body's working, I guess 
similar to blood flow not going to your GI system. I would imagine yeah. it's going away from your kidneys as well, and yeah. you know your uh, urinary system isn't kind of doing what it needs to do to you know process everything. Um, so you got to do it early and often. Um, super important. So let's get into kind of this electrolyte thing. You talked about the benefit of kind of preloading beforehand. Um, you know how much electrolytes. Um, do we actually need for a marathon? Yes. So electrolytes, again, are going to vary in the amount that you need based on your climate, your humidity, how old you are, you know, your sex, all of those things are taken into account. Um, again, but I do have a bare minimum for you guys. So at minimum, 250 milligrams of sodium per hour is recommended. So some gels have added electrolytes in them. So you can get your electrolytes from gels. You can get your electrolytes from a drink, from a beverage. Um, you can get your electrolytes from a salt tab. Although I don't usually recommend salt tabs as a first line of action because it can cause some GI distress. But, you know, again, takes experimentation. It takes all kinds. Some people do just fine with salt tabs. So you have to just look at the back of your labels, read what's in your gels, read what's in your, in your beverages, and really experiment with what works. But that 250 milligrams an hour is a good bare minimum threshold. It's actually what I try to do in Alaska, just because it's like, I mean, it's not really hot here. It's not humid here. So it's just, you know, base level sodium levels that I try to get in um, on my runs. And as it gets hotter, I would add more. As I'd recommend to my athletes, you just add more as it gets hotter. Um, and that's where that careful consideration of working with a dietitian can come in to help you just really like nail it in just that fine bit more. It just, it can make such a big difference. So um, minimum, the sodium is the most important and 250 milligrams per hour. Okay. And yeah, I think that was the biggest uh, mistake that I made personally on my first marathon attempt uh, in which I did hit the wall at mile mm -hmm. 20 and was in extreme pain from cramping calves on both sides, quads, hamstrings, every muscle group was cramping up. Um, and my whole body was covered in white powdery salt and my lips like tasted all salty. Um, <laughs> so I was losing it all in my sweat. Um, so it does matter um, also on like how sweaty you are as a salt. Uh, how salty you are uh, as a sweater, right? As we yeah. sweat. So that there's some variability there. Um, but it is something that you definitely want to make sure that you supplement with um, during the race and find out again, what's on the course, whether it's noon or Gatorade, and then find out too, like, is that having a lot of sugars in it? right? Because if you don't practice with that <laughs> during those long runs, that could seriously irritate. If every you know water mm -hmm. stop, you're doing like a Gatorade and you're doing a water, right? You want to yeah. make sure that you're practicing um, those as well and finding out what's on the course. And I would highly recommend that you guys practice that on your long runs. Yeah. And if you can, I just always recommend carrying your own stuff. I know that you know for these bigger races like New York City, you're not allowed to have like a vest or anything. So, you know, you've got to kind of practice with what you have, what you're going to have on race day. But as experienced from volunteering at a race this year, the, um, the race director is like, don't, don't like put all of the electrolytes in that they recommend. So like dilute the electrolytes. And I was like, oh no, oh, <laughs> but <laughs> oh, my good, goodness. but like good to learn about, right? Because <laughs> we're just assuming that we're getting, you know, what the, what the package says. So don't assume that you're getting what the package says. Um, so if you can carry your own stuff, but I know that that's not always feasible. So. Yeah. And um, is it helpful for us to get some um, salt in our foods like the day before? So like for me, like for my long run this weekend, I had like a baked potato for dinner, like the night before, is it helpful to add some salt to that? Does that help me at all the next day? Yep, it sure does. Okay. And that's why I recommend preloading with the electrolytes too, because that will help get you a little bit more salt um, in your system as well. Again, another kind of thing like the carbs thing is like misconception because like you always been told like healthy not to add salt to your food. Um, but I find myself adding it um, a little bit as needed, especially during these hot summer months um, yeah. or before uh, races as well. And last question I have for you, Brooke here is what is your top tip? I have a feeling I know what this is because I've, I've been hearing like a recurring theme uh, going on during our chat today. You know, what's your top tip for marathon race day nutrition? Practice, practice, practice. <laughs> 
know your plan, know what works for you. And, you know, don't veer from it. Like once you find something that works for you, don't, don't get, you know, like googly eyed at like the next big product. You, you got to stick with what works for you and practice. That's really the biggest, the biggest piece of advice I have is just practice makes perfect and you got to do, do what works for you. Yeah, I could not agree more. And it takes, you know, some people years to figure this out, oh, yeah. you know, like we're going to give you our recommendations. Um, you know, we have a lot of, you know, one of our partners that we uh, partner with, you can make some great, great products for fueling, um, makes an awesome gel. Now, uh, the edge gel that we absolutely love It's easy on the stomach. Um, they're hydrate can give you electrolytes. Um, so we have all healthy runner discounts, 20% off, um, that we use ourselves and, you know, that we recommend to our runners, but you need to try it, right. And you need to try it during your training before you do it for a race. Um, I could not agree more. Um, thank you so much for bringing that up. And for those that are looking for some more like detailed guidance on race day, even nutrition and tips, we do have a full blueprint on 10 tips to crush your race, which includes a lot of the nutrition and, and hydration strategies that Brooke talked about today. So I will drop that link in the show notes um, as well. And um, yeah, Brooke, as always, like this has been such a enormous uh, pleasure, number one, to you know talk with you again, chat with you. But I really think that this is going to help provide some you know, some concrete details on how to fuel, um, you know, for our marathons and the important things that we really need to look at um, for fueling. So thank you so much for coming on as always. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Make sure you guys follow Brooke um, in, you know, her amazing Instagram uh, page that she shares some amazing content at Intentful Nutrition. Um, and I will drop all of Brooke's links in the uh, show notes as well, wherever you're listening to this, whether you're watching the video version uh, on YouTube or you're watching the replay in Facebook, um, you can check out all of Brooke's awesome awesome value that she helps runners out and fuel. And I just love that you have the kind of total body mindset and um, are, are all about making our, our fuel performance and life um, better as runners. So thank you so much for all the great work that you do. And as always runners, let's maintain a strong mind, a strong body, and just keep running until next time. Bye.